Reverend Major Paul Heinbach. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and fellow residents of McClure. Although we've only lived, my wife and I, Donna, have only lived in McClure since 2004, we have some uh, earlier connections with friendships uh, with the Jones family, and I see Jim here today. He and his uh, sister Betty were uh, high school friends of ours, of mine, uh, when uh, their family attended my father's church down in uh, Chapman Township, uh, Chapman Community Chapel. I was born in New Columbia and raised in Lewisburg, and um, in my, uh, after my seventh year, my parents moved to uh, Port Trevor in uh, RD, and Dad took up uh, preaching at that church, in, uh, like I just mentioned. Uh, I went to Seals Grove High School, and during my senior year, at Seals Grove we had to all do, uh, do a research project. And my research project was focused on the aviation industry, and basically that's where my interest in the U.S. Air Force was born, because the Air Force had a new fighter coming on board at that time, um, the F-104 Starfighter, and it was uh, an exceptionally fast uh, airplane, and of course you know the kids, the young men, uh, speed is everything. So. Uh, uh, when, after I graduated, I went to Penn State and enrolled in uh, Air Force ROTC. And um, the day I put on that blue uniform, even though I wasn't in the military, I was hooked. And um, I uh, still had no idea of what I was going to do as a career, but uh, I knew I wanted to do something uh, in the Air Force. And um, if I got lucky, maybe I'd become a pilot. After two years at Penn State, uh, with uh, lack of direction and not know, really knowing what I wanted to do, I decided to uh, change what I was doing and uh, went to be with my parents who had moved in the interim uh, to southern Ohio on the Ohio River in a little town called New Boston. And uh, that's where I met the uh, young woman who would become my wife and like me. Uh, although I had uh, uh, no direction, uh, I started looking for the Air Force because jobs were really hard to come by at that time, and uh, talked my dad into allowing me to join the Air Force. I was only uh, 19, and at that time you had to have parents' permission to, to join. So uh, he was very reluctant because he thought I was giving up on my education. And uh, I got him convinced by taking him down to the recruiter, and the recruiter uh, convinced him that the Air Force was a great uh, uh, career to pursue and also get an education at the same time. So um, he reluctantly signed, and away I went uh, to join the Air Force. And now that blue uniform was real. Uh, in the uh, course of basic training, I had enlisted for electronics training, but uh, the senior NCO at my first career counseling uh, session said, sorry about that young man, uh, we don't have any more slots open in electronics, how would you like to be a cook? Well, I had no problem with being a cook, but uh, I wanted to do something more than uh, cook food, because I was averse to kitchens. and. Um, so I uh, took the ac language aptitude test and passed it. I had had two years of Latin in Seals Grove and a year of French, so I think I was pretty well equipped to take that test, and I did and passed it. And so at the conclusion of my basic training, I was sent to Syracuse University, where I studied Bulgarian for nine months. <laughs> After uh, that school of nine months where we studied language and local history, is Slavic history and Slavic uh, traditions. Uh, because I was valedictorian in my class, I got to choose where I wanted to go in the final one assignment. And my choices were Greece, Cyprus, or Turkey. 
or Greece, Cyprus, Turkey, or Germany. Uh, since I had a German name and I wanted to learn a little bit about Germany, I chose Germany. And lo and behold, I got to be in a flying outfit there. And for over three years, three and a half years, I flew as a crewman in a C-130 as a voice intercept processing specialist. Now what that meant was we patrolled the borders of the Soviet Union and its satellite countries uh, listening to what they were saying, copying down what they were saying on tape, taking those tapes home and then transcribing them and sending them on to higher headquarters. We had some pretty interesting uh, experiences in that flying assignment, but um, I wasn't getting any closer to uh, achieving my goal of uh, an education, so um, at about the three-quarter point of my tour, I applied for a program called the Airman's Education and Commissioning Program. Fortunately, I was accepted for that, and I had my choice of San Francisco State, Arizona State, or Michigan State. Well, that was pretty much an easy choice because my parents lived in Ohio. Michigan State was uh, close to uh, where I wanted to be because my uh, sweetheart was also there in Ohio. And, um, I spent 21 months at Michigan State uh, getting my degree and then went on to San Antonio, Texas for uh, officer training school. After officer training school, I was sent to the Armed Forces Air Intelligence Training Center in Denver, Colorado, where I had a nine-month course of uh, instruction that uh, taught me how to be an air intelligence officer or a photo interpreter. Both uh, skills were conferred upon the um, uh, graduation there, and since I had six and a half years enlisted time, and uh, Air Training Command was having trouble finding officers as replacements of staff who was going uh, to Southeast Asia as that war was cranking up, uh, they invited me to stay on the staff. I accepted that and um, was there for about four months before I got one of those ominous calls from um, Air Force Headquarters saying, oh, it's time for you to get ready to go to uh, war. And so they gave me a four-month notice that I would be going about Christmas time uh, to uh, Vietnam or somewhere in Southeast Asia. Um, it was a, a pretty hectic uh, time in that I had a, a wife and two young children and uh, we were no longer allowed to live on base in Denver, so we opted to go back to my wife's hometown area, and I moved her and the boys back to uh, Southern Ohio, and off I went uh, in February, actually, to uh, Thailand, which is where my assignment was. I learned that this uh, assignment to Thailand was to a tactical fighter wing where the fighter wing was employing F 105s. Now, I have a model here of an F 105 that you're welcome to come up and take a look at, but it was uh, one of the hottest airplanes at the time, hot when I say speed, because even with bomb loads and external fuel tanks, it was uh, capable of exceeding the speed of sound uh, at low altitude. So uh, that was uh, their actual um, uh, employment tactic, was to penetrate enemy defenses at low altitude, 5,000 feet or below. And um, at that altitude, there wasn't any other airplane in the world that could catch them. Uh, as I left for Thailand, uh, I did a typical thing there in that I went to uh, the uh, aerial port, which is Travis Air Force Base in California, which is basically outside of San Francisco. And uh, I got there real early in the morning after traveling uh, from the afternoon, I think, into the late evening. And something like 2 o'clock, and they said, well, we're not, we don't have another flight leaving until late tonight. Well, that was pretty typical of Air Force travel because um, they would leave late at night, fly all through the night, and then uh, you'd get uh, to your uh, assigned location the next day sometime. When I had gone to Germany for my first time, it was across the Atlantic, 
and a propeller driven airplane and uh, um, me mesh netting, uh, nylon netting seats facing backwards and that wasn't too comfortable but at least this trip was on Continental Airlines the proud bird with the golden tail. I had never flown on Continental before so I was really excited about that but uh, my excitement died after we were loaded because they had stripped all the normal aircraft seats out there, out of it, and, and aircraft, uh, Air Force type seats, which were jammed together to get as many people in that airplane as they could. So it was kind of like an airborne cattle car. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, we got to, uh, after stops in Honolulu and uh, uh, Saigon, we got to Bangkok uh, in early afternoon and uh, Don Wong International Airport. And uh, we had the bad news that uh, the shuttle flight to the outlying bases had already left for the day, and we were just going to have to spend the night in Bangkok. So uh, uh, a number of us uh, said, well, this is good news because we'll get to uh, have a nice meal and uh, have a nice bed overnight. So uh, that's what we did. But we had to listen to this um, uh, orientation briefing first, uh, given by a sergeant who had given it so many times that he was bored. But the key thing that I remember about that, and I think everybody else was, was the phrase that uh, you're going to be going into town uh, and around as you travel here uh, the next day uh, on Thai taxis. And uh, you have to understand that if you're in an accident, you've got to grab your bags and run like uh, blazes because uh, passengers are responsible for all damage and accidents. Uh, accidents. Well, I was fortunate there wasn't an accident in my cab, so uh, I weathered that storm. Next morning, back to uh, Bangkok, uh, Don Mong International Airport, and uh, signed in with the aerial port and uh, got my uh, first ride on the Air Force C-130 called the Klong. Now the Klong in uh, Thailand are uh, uh, waterways, dirty water, stinky water that uh, are used to uh, convey people and goods to various places. As a matter of fact, in Bangkok they have an internationally known floating market that's on one of the Klong. And I think one of the Air Force guys named this C-130 the Klong uh, kind of a, as uh, a joke because uh, it was a, a stinky ride that carried people in, in good. Uh, anyhow, when I got back to uh, the aerial port the next morning, uh, on to the Klong, and uh, I was fortunate that Karat, my base of assignment, which was in the center of Thailand, uh, was the first stop. And uh, so I got out off the Klong um, first, but when the loadmaster opened the, the cargo doors in the rear, I took a whiff and I said, whoo, this is going to take some getting used to. As soon as I got checked in, uh, they sent me uh, down the street to uh, wing operations, and that's where I met my new boss and some of my coworkers. And um, I spent a few minutes there uh, saying hello and so forth. And the boss said, are you tired? Uh, you want to get some rest? And uh, he grabbed one of the other lieutenants uh, who volunteered and uh, sent me on my way to finish my check-in. Um, I, I did that, checked in uh, to the uh, BOQ office, got my hooch assignment. A hooch is the place where we live. And it was kind of like an oversized uh, uh, stateside gazebo with um, uh, roofs that jutted out from the side in addition to the main roof. And that was to cover the uh, bands of screening that went all the way around the hooch to allow air in and keep out the mosquitoes and other bugs. Uh, when I got to my hooch, uh, I noticed that uh, there were four bunks in, the, in this building and uh, one in each corner along with a, a little desk and a desk lamp and a rail behind the bed for hanging your uniforms and civilian clothing. And of the four beds, there was only one that had no shoes under it, so I knew that was mine. <laughs> and um, in addition to the four beds, there was uh, a couple uh, 
shared overhead uh, fans and a large refrigerator. I checked out the refrigerator and there was fresh pineapple in that baby and I was impressed. Uh, I didn't need any of it right then, but in coming days I had lots of it. And uh, so I uh, dropped my bags, pulled back the, sh the uh, covers and the sheets and said, hmm, this is going to take some getting used to also because the sheets were wet. We got uh, daily, seemingly, uh, heavy thunderstorms and yeah, we have uh, heavy thunderstorms here in McClure, but tropical downpours are something different. And uh, the uh, screening that kept out the bugs also allowed all that moisture to come in and, and get the sheets wet. Uh, no matter, I dived in bed and uh, fell asleep almost instantly and slept until about uh, five or so when I got awake and saw one of my hooch mates there changing clothes and that's when I asked him about the refrigerator and the pineapple. I said, who does that belong to? He said, you. He said, and um, I said, uh, well, how does it get there? He said, uh, the hooch girl uh, comes every day with fresh pineapple and uh, loads of refrigerator. And I said, uh, what else does she do? Well, she shines your shoes, she presses your clothes, she washes your clothes. Uh, makes your bed, cleans the floor, does everything that you would need uh, to keep your um, area spotless. And I said, I'm going for that. Who pays for that? He said, you do. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's in your bill for the club every month. And I said, well, that's fair. I mean, I couldn't imagine somebody else doing all those neat things for me, especially polishing shoes, because I had so many years of polishing shoes that it was tiresome. Anyhow, uh, about uh, 5.36, I got up and went to the club where we took all our meals. Uh, Ed showed up, uh, the guy who had uh, squired me around, and uh, we went to the club. Uh, I was kind of a, a popular attraction for that evening because I was a new guy, and nobody likes anything more than a new guy uh, who they can stick it to uh, for the, guy, the time until he's no longer the new guy. So. Um, as we finished our dinner, um, lots of people would come by and make catty remarks about the new guy and uh, wanted to know when I was going to be thrown into the meat grinder. And uh, Ed says, tomorrow. He gets his orientation tomorrow and it won't be too long. But anyhow, um, next morning I got up uh, bright and early and uh, had a leisurely shower and shave and walked over to the club for breakfast. and. Uh, Ed met me at the door and he said, now one thing you've got to remember here, Paul, is when you go in this door, you better not be covered. Now all the military guys here know what uh, being covered means. It means you're wearing your hat inside the door. Now if, uh, if these guys over here, the honor guard, were to uh, be like that, uh, and there weren't be any honor guard, or anybody back here in the crowd wearing a hat in the end of the club at Karat, you got to open your wallet and buy for everyone in the club. <laughs> so uh, there was a sign right in this door, inside the door that said, He who enters covered here buys for all a round of cheer. <laughs> uh, I never had uh, the privilege of uh, performing that function because I was always uh, very attentive to what I was doing when I went into the um, club. Uh, after uh, breakfast then we went to work and uh, I met the boss. He says, again, he was a major old thing. He said, uh, you got some sleep? Uh, you all rested up? You ready to go to work? And I said, oh yeah, boss, I'm ready to go to work. I uh, have been told a lot by Ed about what uh, the pace of work is here. It sounds very exciting and I'm ready to contribute. I didn't tell him how scared I was about uh, being in a combat wing and interacting with uh, uh, fighter pilots who uh, just uh, have the greatest egos in the world. I mean, I, I've never met people like them before or since, but uh, they know that God made them first and made them best, and uh, they would always be that way. Uh, anyhow, uh, after uh, I, I got my reassurances from the boss that I'd be able to handle that, um, 
he told Ed to uh, take me around and show me some briefings and debriefings and to get me caught up on the rules of engagement, which basically were the rules of the war. What the pilots could do and what they couldn't do. Where they could drop ordnance and where they couldn't. What they could drop on this target, what they could, had to drop on that target. So on and so forth. And it was a fairly uh, thick set of uh, rules that um, was uh, so important that the pilots weren't even allowed to fly until they had passed the test uh, indicating they had uh, understood the rules of engagement and uh, um, knew how to do their job. And uh, as an intelligence officer, we had to do the same thing because we had two basic functions there in the wing. We had to brief them before their flights, tell them where their targets were, uh, what the defenses were in the target area, when they were supposed to be on time uh, on the target, called time on target or TOT, and uh, also the various other aspects of what had happened in the last couple days to uh, bring them up to speed so they would minimize their risk as they um, went uh, out to uh, bomb their target. <clears throat> I followed uh, either Ed Weiss, First Lieutenant Ed Weiss, or First Lieutenant Mark Wilcox uh, for two days, uh, sitting in on debriefings, sitting in on briefings, and uh, I was uh, impressed by uh, the professionalism of uh, all the intel officers, and I knew that I really had to work hard in order to uh, um, maintain the standards that they uh, had established. Uh, one of the other things I learned uh, about um, during that period of time of uh, orientation was that the fact that uh, the F-105s were in Thailand and bombing North Vietnam was a secret. A secret to everybody except the newspapers, the Stars and Stripes, who published every day what the F-105s were doing in Thailand. And uh, the only difference was that the king of Thailand and the government would not recognize the fact that Americans were carrying out uh, bombing of North Vietnam from Thai bases. So it was a secret that everybody knew about, but we couldn't talk about it. And um, the uh, 105, as I said before, uh, was the, the weapon of choice, and uh, it was a, uh, a very large airplane. You can't really get a, a feel for the size of it from this model, but it was larger than most all other fighters in uh, uh, Southeast Asia and Vietnam. The F-4 was pretty close, and the F-4 actually uh, was able to carry more ordnance, but um, that was uh, on paper. Um, with the uh, tactic of uh, penetrating defenses at low altitude, uh, 5,000 feet or below, um, the, the uh, F-4 had to um, use uh, afterburners in order to keep up with the 105. And they would fly just under the speed of sound of 575 or so knots or nautical miles uh, per hour. And of course, Jim Jones would know what a knot is because uh, the Navy kind of invented that uh, thing, but a nautical mile is 6,080 feet uh, as compared to what we know of miles as uh, statute miles of 5,280 feet. So uh, everything uh, in flying is uh, uh, figured in terms of nautical miles per hour. Uh, one of the things that set the F-105 apart from uh, the F-4 at that time was it had an internal gun. It had a Vulcan six-barrel uh, machine gun that, uh, Gatling gun actually, that fired a 20 millimeter round. And I'm going to pass this around, but this little case here has two dummy 20 millimeter rounds along with the projectile that was in one of these uh, 20 millimeters. And up here on the top was another uh, thing that I got from uh, Mr. Laub at the local um, surplus store called a flechette. And these flechettes were included in bombs that were configured from uh, cases that looked like 
750 pound bombs. And uh, these things would have either lachettes like this or similar to this, or they would have um, bomblets that looked uh, about like a little baseball, smaller than a little baseball. And um, if I could have somebody come up here and take this and pass it around. And uh, this uh, bomb, when it was dropped, just like another bomb, had a, a seam of prime accord around the middle of the bomb so that when it got to uh, 5,000 or so feet above the ground level, this prime accord would fire and it separate the bomb and all these little flechettes would uh, rain down upon the enemy. We got a classified report into our intel shop as these things were coming online and going uh, to be used against the enemy. And this report was classified secret and it was sent from the company that made the bombs containing the flechettes. And they said that they had conducted a, a test of these things in a, an open field. And of course, nobody uh, wanted to act as a, a tester. So um, they set up a test spot of 100 yards by 100 yards. And every yard in there, they put a four foot high, one inch by one inch stake. And uh, they figured that uh, four feet was tall enough to uh, reflect the average height of most Orientals. And uh, the object was to see how many of those sticks, uh, and how many, somebody here can do that real quick and tell me how many sticks were in that 100 by 100 yard? 100 by 100, I think is 10,000. 10, 10, Anyhow, um, all these sticks were erected and they flew a mission against them and dropped this uh, CBU bomb and uh, there was not one stick standing uh, uncut uh, or unbroken or smashed by that CBU. So they were absolutely devastated. And uh, they were used by uh, uh, a mission called uh, Wild Weasels. And that was a code name for the SAM, or Surface to Air Missile, Hunter Killer uh, folks who uh, flew with the strike forces. And their only purpose in life was to go in like a weasel did. A uh, weasel went into a hole to get out. Uh, 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 dachshunds went into a hole to get out uh, the weasels. And uh, this airplane did the same sort of thing. Early in the war, they were F-100s, which were supersonic aircraft, but they didn't have nearly the capability of the 105. And uh, about three months after I uh, was assigned there, uh, they switched over to F-105. They finally came on board. And um, the uh, interesting thing about the debriefing of these guys was that since they had no specific target assigned, they were all over the sky. And it was extremely difficult to uh, get them to tell their story and know exactly where they were and uh, get it down on paper. But that was a challenge that uh, we really liked. I uh, was assigned to the Wild Weasels on paper, but all of we intelligence officers were assigned to the wing headquarters and that's where all of our work was done. Uh, my two uh, friends, Ed Wiest and uh, Mark Wilcox, uh, were assigned to the 421st and the 469th Tactical Fire Squadron. And uh, uh, as I said, I was uh, assigned to the Wild Weasels. Um, <clears throat> our, our daily work was uh, 10 to 12 hours a day. Uh, we arrive about 10 30 or 7 30 in the morning and work until 5 30 or 7 30 depending upon when all the missions were re had returned and uh, debriefings completed and the reports were written. Um, we had six days of work and one day uh, off a week and on days off we would uh, always sleep in 
because we always had to get up early on other days, and so I, I don't think there was a day I had off that I didn't sleep in. And we'd, uh, after uh, getting some breakfast or lunch at the club, we'd uh, uh, go downtown to shop uh, in the shops for uh, stuff like Thai silk, uh, wood carvings, jewelry, bronzeware, or other things made in Thailand that would make nice mementos to either send home or take home. It was on one of these trips downtown that I got uh, exposed to some real Thai culture. And that was when, when I got onto the bus, I noticed, well, the bus was full mostly of Thai people. And uh, I saw one empty seat about uh, a little over halfway back on the left side. So I went back and, uh, and my buddy, uh, we sat in that seat. And I noticed as I sat down, there was a young Thai woman in the seat behind us. And she had a, on her lap a box approximately oh, 12, 14 inches square and about eight, in, 8 inches high. And I had no idea which of what it was, and I wasn't worried about it, but I, we hadn't gone very far until I heard uh, what appeared to be scratching on this box. And uh, the guy across the aisle from us uh, was a GI, and he said, you know what that girl has? And I shook my head no, and he said, she's got a box of rice bugs. I said, what are rice books? He said, well, you've probably seen them out there on the flight line uh, around the um, um, big lights uh, every night because they have these long poles with nets on them catching them like butterflies. And I said, yeah, I, I saw them doing that, but I didn't know what in the world they were doing. He said, yeah, well, rice bugs are considered to be a delicacy in Thailand. And they eat them one of three ways. They either eat them raw, uh, and crunch them uh, as a snack, or they eat them in soups or uh, in stir fry. And these bugs were about two and a half to three inches long and about an inch to an inch and a half in width. And they looked to me like giant cockroaches <laughs> because they were exactly the same color. And about that time, this woman. As I was turning around, she opened the box, and <laughs> sure enough, the box was filled with rice bugs. Well, I, needless to say, I never tried any of the rice bugs while I was in Thailand. But anyhow, um, beyond that day off, we had, uh, excuse me, an opportunity for three weekends of R&R, &R, uh, once every three months. Uh, and uh, my first R&R, uh, &R, I went to Chiang Mai, which was in the northwest of Thailand. My second one, I went to uh, Kadena Air Force Base in Okinawa, because there's a, a huge uh, Air Force Base exchange there, and I wanted to buy a new camera. And then my third one, I went to Bangkok. That was my last one, because I wanted to go uh, check out Bangkok uh, for the weekend that I'd be leaving permanently to uh, return to the state. And uh, everybody talked about Nick's number one restaurant as having the finest uh, Kobe beef in the world. And uh, so that's where I went. And I ordered Kobe beef and uh, French onion soup, just like everybody else who went to Nick's number one. And uh, it was truly delectable. Uh, very expensive for the time. I think the, the steak was $35. And um, I understood later that if you bought it in Japan, it was several times that. In addition to uh, our uh, primary jobs of briefing and debriefing, and all this uh, uh, atmosphere was uh, secret or top secret. Our daily stuff was secret, and then we had materials of a top secret nature in our uh, library that uh, we also had to worry about. Um, the briefings varied from simple two-ship flights going into relatively easy, uh, lightly defended areas to uh, what we call big gaggles or big shows. And the big gaggle or big show was a room that was not quite this big, but uh, there was seating in there uh, for over 50 people in addition to executive officer, seat, officer seating down front. And the executive officer was the wing commander, the vice wing commander, and various other big wigs who they might invite to the big gaggles. Uh, and um, 
The only exception to that was the base mascot, Roscoe. Roscoe was a golden retriever that was uh, a friend of everybody on the base, and he went wherever he wanted. And if the wing commander wasn't sitting in his chair, that's where Roscoe lay. Uh, in addition to this uh, um, room, and this is where uh, we had all, like I said, all of the briefings for the flights that were going downtown. And that meant uh, they were going down into the really heavily defended area around Hanoi. And uh, some of the uh, write-ups in the newspapers at the time uh, contended that this was the most heavily defended uh, real estate in the world with AAA from 23 to uh, 35, 57, and then uh, 85 and 100. And the, um, the smaller ones up through uh, 57 would, uh, went, were like flak uh, that they called popcorn balls when they went off. And the big ones were uh, big boomers that uh, would rock their world even if they came close. <coughs> and then of course there were the surface air missiles and um, they uh, were a problem, they were the main problem for our guys. Um, the, at first, the uh, uh, North Vietnamese wouldn't even send up their fighters when they were planning on using SAMs against our uh, folks, but uh, uh, as time went on, they got uh, more daring and would employ those folks, to the, the uh, MiGs, at the same time that they would use. Uh, Sands. Now, although I have described and talked about intelligence briefings, we were one of three different groups who briefed at every one of these uh, occasions. We also had operations briefings who would brief them on call signs, uh, all of the operational aspects of uh, um, their call, uh, radio communications and their tankers. Every flight that ever went out of Parat used air-to-air -air refueling because it was impossible for them to uh, get to their target and get back uh, without it. And for big gaggles, when they were going into the Hanoi area, they would uh, refuel going in and uh, inevitably refuel coming back out uh, in order to get back home. Uh, the briefing officer's uh, work started every night at about 11 o'clock uh, because the first fl flight that he was briefing was about 3 o'clock in the morning. And then uh, he would go through a cycle of briefing approximately six different groups until his four to six, depending on what the scheduling was for the day. And uh, this would go on until roughly uh, 7 o'clock in the morning when his uh, tour would end and the afternoon flight's briefer would come in and take over. The afternoon briefer uh, had exactly the same kind of uh, day, except that he had to put up with uh, returning air crews and other day workers uh, wandering <coughs> through his work work area. Most of the work to prepare for all of this, the actual physical thing, went into a thing called the combat mission folder, which was classified secret. And the combat mission folder had photographs of the target they were going against. It had the map of uh, the target area, the refueling area, and every area that was anticipated these guys would fly over. And they were constructed from maps that were made originally in um, uh, St. Louis, Missouri at the uh, Aeronautical Charting and Information Center, ACIC. And the reason that they had to build special maps was because on occasion when a target would be right on the edge of a published map, well, if they didn't uh, put two maps together or three or four if it was down in a corner, uh, a lot of the area that the pilot was going to be uh, dealing with would, would be off the map. So, so uh, it took our guys, a team of uh, five, 
about eight hours to assemble all of the materials for the uh, flights for the coming day. And uh, if they didn't get it all done in eight hours, they just worked until it was finished. That was one of the things that uh, I learned over there. Nobody goes home with work left uh, for tomorrow except what happens. <clears throat> the debriefing schedule was uh, posted uh, on the board every morning when we came to work about 7.30 by the senior guy. And while I was there, we had just about all lieutenants that were doing the briefing and debriefing. Um, I'll give you a little uh, uh, vignette of a, an exception to that in a few minutes. Um, but uh, we worked it kind of like uh, whoever is available when the next group of guys come in, they're the one that takes the place, regardless of what the schedule says. About three weeks after I got to um, uh, Karat, um, I got notice that uh, Major Olson wanted to see me. And I said, what do you want to see me about? Nobody knew. So I went in and reported and I uh, said, you wanted to see me, sir? And he said, yeah. He said, I got in a message this morning that I have a requirement to provide an intelligence officer to fly on board uh, an airborne command post and um, want to know if you're interested in flying. I said, well, I've flown before. I have uh, three and a half years of flying experience, and I have the enlisted crew member wings to prove it. Um, where's this command post flying? He said, well, it's dog patch and it flies over Laos. And I said, uh, well, sir, if it flies over Laos, I can't go. And he looked at me incredulously and he said, huh? What do you mean you can't go? Like uh, a mere lieutenant would tell him what he couldn't do. And I said, well, it's uh, simple. I said, uh, I was in a highly classified job before I came here. And as I was debriefed, one of the things they told me was that I could not go to, through, or even fly over any country that was Soviet, Soviet-leaning, or Soviet-friendly. And among all those countries listed, Laos was on the list. So I can't go. He said, show me the paper. He, he said it was, yeah, kind of a sneer. So I said, well, back at the hooch. i got to go back there so he go get it. So I went back to the hooch, got my paper, came back, and went in without even knocking. I handed him the paper, and uh, he never acknowledged that what I had said was true. He just handed the paper back to me, and he said, you don't want to lose this. I said, uh, yeah, you're right. Well, within 10 minutes, he called on First Lieutenant Bob DiDomaso. And this time, uh, he told Bob that the reason he picked him was because he was the only unmarried officer uh, in uh, working under him. And I thought that was curious that his criteria uh, had changed from earlier to me being the new guy uh, to Bob being the only unmarried guy. Uh, within a day, Bob was uh, on the clung going to uh, Udorn, where Dog Patch flew out of, which is in the north of Thailand. And uh, he started flying on dog patch immediately. Well, we started getting letters back from him to his uh, buddies, my coworkers, and um, he started telling us about his experience of flying on dog patch. And uh, by the second week of his being there, one of the letters said that they were flying over North Vietnam today. And I couldn't believe that anybody would fly. Uh, an unarmed C-47 Goonie Bird from World War II uh, over North Vietnam and uh, a very heavily uh, defended area. I, my thought and statement was, well, if they keep doing that, they're not going to last long. Within a month, we got a, a message saying the dog patch was down. And uh, that dog patch, there were a number of those airplanes using the same call sign. Uh, was never heard from again. Uh, Bob's parents uh, ultimately got his military ID card and the personal belongings that he had uh, in his quarters in Thailand. That's it. Uh, his name is not on the wall uh, in Washington, D.C. because the war in Laos was a CIA covert war and 
was never recognized by anybody, and therefore um, he just is treated as uh, a non-entity. Uh, I feel fortunate every day since April 1966 that I'm still living because basically it could have been me that went down on Dog Patch instead of Bob if I hadn't had that security firm. So uh, that was uh, one of my uh, most lasting uh, memories. And I, I did uh, talk to uh, his sister many years later after uh, the book that I'm going to talk about in a minute uh, came out. I was uh, motivated to contact old buddies and talk about it. But this is the first time that I've ever talked about my experiences over there. Uh, not that it was anything uh, outrageous that happened to me, but uh, I just never, never felt right. And when Andrew Benner uh, asked me to speak today, I uh, said, yeah. And then after giving him some thought, I thought, nah, this would be a good time to uh, uh, talk about this. <clears throat> when I first got there, the wing was the 6234, the provisional wing. And uh, about two or three months later, it uh, was disestablished and replaced by a newly constituted uh, wing called the 388. About the same time, we got uh, two more squadrons. So we went from two squadrons to four squadrons. Excuse me, I'm getting uh, signs back there that I've talked too long. So anyhow, uh, this is um, uh, what we dealt with uh, from there on out. Uh, I've got three books here that uh, deal with this war. This one is uh, covers the year that I was there, 1966. And the uh, writer is a friend of mine, Ed Rass Rasmus. And this one was his second tour where he went over there to fly the F-4. He also is a co-writer of this one with the uh, daughter of the guy who's the subject of this book, named Colonel uh, Robin Olds. I, I commend these to you for further reading, uh, and uh, uh, I apologize for taking so long, but uh, I live in McClure, and if you uh, should happen to be a winner of one of the books, or if you want to order these, they're all readily available for Books A Million. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to entertain them. You glad it's over?